Hello everyone, I'm Maggie Flanagan. Uh, today we are kicking off our next uh, webinar session. Today we are going to be hearing from Dr. Melissa Murray, who is the Associate Professor of Neuroscience at the ADRC at Mayo Clinic. She is a co-investigator and today she will be presenting an overview on the APERIO image analysis software for quantitative tissue analysis in digital neuropathology research settings. Following Dr. Murray's talk, we will have a live Q&A session with our additional panelists, uh, which I'll introduce now. So in addition to Dr. Murray, we have Dr. Lafia Kapasi, Assistant Professor of Pathology and Research Neuropathologist at Rush University, Michael Regan, Senior Application Specialist in Pathology Imaging for Leica Biosystems, and Sandra Camelo Paragua, Clinical Associate Professor of Neuropathology, Fellowship Director at the University of Michigan. So thank you all very much uh, for your participation today. And I would just like to also note that this event is not sponsored by APERIO, nor ARNAC or the EDRC Digital Pathology Working Group members endorsing APERIO through hosting and publishing this webinar. The goal of this webinar is for members of the Digital Pathology Working Group and our speakers to share their personal experience with using Aperio software to educate others. Um, so I will pass this along to Dr. Murray. Looking forward to hearing your talk. Thank you very much. I'm excited to have an opportunity to kind of, I guess, chronicle the story of Aperio. I've been embedded in the technology for quite a while now, and I have really enjoyed seeing the explosion of digital pathology and um, just really kind of wanted to have a great conversation. As Maggie indicated, please feel free to add any questions and we're happy to discuss at the end as a group effort. So I've really utilized the technology in several different means and methods. One, either through actually investigating the size of a structure, even though it's a five micron slide, this does really nicely associate with neuroimaging methods, whether that's also looking at cellular density or burden analyses um, across either disease pathology or more along the lines of the histologic health of the tissue. And especially even focal nuclei, really a lot of the, the nuclear macros work very well within very well-defined nuclei. And this has really kind of helped gain an understanding and relationship one with either structural MR or kind of getting a sense of the different types of Alzheimer's disease pathology as I've exampled here with amyloid plaques. Um, I'm really interested in tangle maturity. So looking at different types of immunohistochemical measures that then maybe perhaps directly relate to standard measures that have been in place for many decades and, and helping us to understand that. Also, as newer modalities are introduced to the field, understanding the relationship to the underlying pathology. And this can also be to visualize. We like to look at co-pathologies or perhaps off target. And this enables us to look at serial sections at once and really gain that perspective to be able to then translate to many different clinical applications. Because really the goal is, to begin at the end to inform the beginning. And this really gives us that opportunity to dive in deep into the brain. And so just by way of a historical perspective, and then we'll talk a little bit about the purpose. And I wanted to design today to give you an idea of the workflow. I think that when you're approaching digital pathology, having that confidence of how you would move forward really will allow you to accelerate the, the utilization of the technology. So as far as digital pathology goes, and from a historical perspective, we've had microscopy since the 1600s, where we've, whether that's looking at plant cell biology, um, and this has really morphed once we were able and capable of utilizing photomicrographs. Um, this continued to evolve as the notion of telepathology was introduced, although not widely accepted until very recently, given the current climate where we need to be able to still read slides, communicate. And in the 2000s, digital pathology was introduced. I fell in love with digital pathology because I actually have very severe motion sickness that even under the microscope can affect me. And as I 
really wanted to embrace a career in neuropathology, I really started to get kind of worried that this was not going to be capable. And the advent of digital pathology had really just kind of come about and I was able to then still embrace it uh, as I've worked on my motion sickness. And we are now a part of the future. And so I'm excited for your uh, in interest today. So Aperio Technology has been around uh, for quite a while. It's now owned by Leica. And when the um, originator first built the scanner in his garage um, out of a uh, place in California, um, he really wanted to apply the concept of revealing the pathology. As we look down a microscope, we have multi heads so that we can share in the joy of the neuropathology, but what can we do to really unmask a lot of uh, interest in, in giving us a broader perspective? And so the terminology has actually evolved. You may see in the literature, virtual microscopy, digital microscopy was there for a while. But I think the field has very much embraced and thus the name of our working group, digital pathology. And so I really recommend that when you're inserting your keywords and typing up your different um, perspectives to consider having that unified term to enable for accurate searching. Dr. Duggar, who co-chairs this working group, came up with a great idea to inventory and to sort of send out a questionnaire amongst the different ADRCs. And so Aperio's Leica technology is the most commonly used across the ADRCs. As you've seen in our other webinars, there's many other very useful uh, technologies, but this is the one that has enabled us to a little bit more translate across multi-site centers. And the technology is really dependent upon what your intent is. There's diagnostic purposes. So perhaps it's only reading a few slides. And so they do have smaller scan capacities. There's a fly, five slide scan capacity. If it's just this occasional, there is educational aspects. So any of these would serve that of course, but depending upon what volume, um, my lab goes through a fair amount. And so we are, really um, quite fortunate to have an AT2 on campus. Some of the my colleagues who are now actually embracing the Aperio technology have the GT450 and it is pretty exciting, really high resolution, much quicker than I'm even used to. And so the technology just, just continues to improve upon itself. Um, one of the things I think I really like the most though is it's not just a scanning platform. I'm, I love organization and there are infinite ways to organize, but in a very straightforward manner, you just have to really stick to it from the beginning and, and consider what your plans are. And especially for us where the ultimate goal is quantitative assessment, you have to really understand or embrace whatever workflow. And so I just thought I'd introduce you to our workflow. I won't go too far in detail, but very much open to any questions or, or what have you. Um, as far as digital pathology goes, garbage in, garbage out. So it very much starts even prior to the scanning process. Um, I won't go way too far down the rabbit hole, but I would like to talk to you guys a little bit more about slide preparation. Um, we'll talk a little bit about scanning, what it looks like in the interface that enables you to organize, and then the actual interface um, individually with the slides. And so let's first talk about slide prep. So some of the things that I recommend and, and what we consider in my group or those that I'm able to have the opportunity to collaborate with is the label. We are in an era and hopefully the whole point, one of the other whole points of the working group besides this webinar that Dr. Flanagan has organized is to facilitate slide sharing. And so I challenge you to start thinking about your slide labels and what type of information is on there. Are they de-identified? Uh, fortunately, we have Dr. Pierce in our working group who's brilliant and knows how to actually scrub the slide um, should you need. But in my group, we really like to know what we're going after. This is a control slide, so it's okay that the disease is there, but I'm gonna just fast forward. Be thoughtful about what you put on there. If you have your slides labeled as control and then whatever disease of interest, that could bias the individual who's tracing. We really wanna think about those unconscious biases. 
Um, we very much like to know the different types of dilutions or even the date. I give every project a name that we then stick with all throughout the process, and this helps to automatically know what we're looking toward. Um, a couple of other things to think about is what is your target region? So for the most part, if you're looking in the cortex and limbic structures, if you're looking at basal ganglia, DAB can serve you quite well. But if you start to consider structures that have pigments, so substantia nigra, um, you may want to consider an alternative chromogen that allows you to look at the pathology of interest or, or what have you, um, independent of the contribution from the pigmented nuclei. I have worked on a lot of macros and I still have difficulty separating those out. Although we are joined today by Michael Reagan, who is super expert in all things up here, yo. Um, although I don't think he'd like me to brag so much on that. So chromogen is a very thoughtful consideration. Most will go with DAB, uh, but be also mindful of cross-reactivity. So sometimes when we, a lot of our towel stains, the vessels will actually show some brown, what looks like actual um, staining in the vessels. And those are things that you're going to want to be mindful of where you can edit them out. There's also artifacts. So instead of showing you a bunch of pictures, I did at least want to give you a, an overview of different artifacts to consider. And this will really impact based upon what is the analysis you're planning. So many of the macros you'll want to edit out dust or tissue folds. So these are, are this can kind of be made better if you were really thoughtful about actually cleaning your slide, but sometimes it's under the slide label or under rather under the uh, cover slip. So we think about tissue folds, squamous cells. Um, we would want to maybe edit out those in case they artifactually have uh, staining or have a dark enough color that would then be identified as positive by the, the macros. Smears. So I don't know how many of you work with amyloid angiopathy. And so a lot of the slides that actually have amyloid angiopathy can have this smear, but uh, it's actually the amyloid coming out of the vessel. And so it's not actual pathology. So be cognizant of that. Many of the macros can be designed to actually avoid white spaces. So tissue tearing will definitely, it's dependent upon the evaluation and then slap splatters. Uh, most importantly, keep an eye on your tissue exhaustion. One of the beautiful aspects of a perio is that we can clone slides. So you're duplicating the slide without duplicating the size. Um, but tissue exhaustion is a really important thing to consider, um, especially in your region of interest, because then what's the point of wasting the last slide if you're not even going to be able to use it? All right. So we've talked about slide prep. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about scanning. Um, I'll give you a little bit of etiquette. Everywhere is different. I am very fortunate at Mayo to have um, our Aperio software embedded within a core that is led by Dr. Laura uh, Lewis Tuffin, who has really good guidance for etiquette. But just a couple things to talk about. Clean your slides. I've already mentioned it. Alcohol, chem wipes. It will make the world of a dis difference as this dust is unfortunately can be, uh, the dust will unfortunately show up a little more than you would like it to be. It doesn't have to be edited, but it's something to consider. Um, I'm not going to go into all the different scanners, but I thought I'd talk to you a little bit about um, the AT2 that we have. It's a 400 slide capacity. They use linear array technology, so it goes down each column. And then what's nice is it actually doesn't have tiling artifacts. Um, so some of the earlier technology would start at one corner, go to the next, and then they would stitch it together like a quilt, which works beautifully visually. But when you go to analyze, there can be some overlap issues. And so this has a seamless border, although it's something to think about in this era uh, where we're going to be applying AI. So you'll see as you adjust the differences and the gains. But when you're scanning your slides, one of the biggest things to keep in mind is the cover slip media. So make sure you give your slides enough time to dry. That can gook up the machine that is very expensive when it only would have taken an extra day or two. So we actually have a, a very conservative wait 48 hours. 
but there is a manual scan option if you need it tomorrow or yesterday rather. Um, and one of the things that's nice about this technology is you can actually set a calibration point. There's an automatic setting. Um, and this is important as it gives guidance to the system as far as what is a clear area so that the system actually recognizes what the microscope slide is. And so what I mean by that is we call it the blue diamond. Um, if your blue diamond was set on the tissue and it's meant to be set on clear, it can cause the tissue to think this is a different slide, but it, it doesn't have appropriate understanding of what is normal slide. And so there's a gradient that will be affected. And so you can really see that overlap. And this is what we call striping artifact, but you'll want to <clears throat> rescan the slide, quite frankly, and just be cognizant of it with silver stains or otherwise, wherever you will actually put the blue diamond to try to um, offset that. Okay, so H&Es are your friends. Uh, strongly stained slides, the scanner recognizes it readily and will auto identify the tissue. And this tiny little guy down here is the blue diamond, so it's automatically recognizing the clear space. The um, scanning area is important for you to consider as you'll continue to use the technology. Um, and I think the compression rate is getting even better. So some of these file sizes may be different for some of the higher end scanners, but tighten up this, these, this edge, you can save still a lot of space by just tightening up along the region of interest. Um, the, the scanner we have has a pseudo doubler for 40X, so it works. It's not as um, elegant as what I've seen with the GT450 where it, it's not a pseudo doubler, it is absolutely gorgeous. Um, and so just be mindful of that. What are your needs? We don't need a 40X. We can go to the, the microscope and take a picture if we really want to zoom in. But if your needs are foci within the nucleus that you can only appreciate when zoomed in, then think about that in advance and what that will actually look like. Okay, talk about slide prep, a little bit about scanning etiquette. Let's talk about the organizational aspects and the viewing software. So this was previously called Spectrum. We have a new person in my lab and I mentioned Spectrum the other day and he was like, what? And so I've needed to adapt to the newer wording. Um, so we, it's now called Aperio eSlide Manager, and it really is. It helps you so much to manage your system. And so the view will go through as project specimens, eSlides. There's other options like for tissue microarrays, uh, and then there's analysis options. But uh, what I like to do when conveying this information is just remind everybody that they've set it up in a hierarchical manner. So just starting at the bottom here, we'll scan in slides. These are the individual slides. So you can actually see each individual slide. Those can then be organized into a specimen. So I like to think about these as individual experiments, if you will, set within the context of an overall project. So one of the slides I showed you earlier is I'm interested to look at differences in inflammation across the Alzheimer's disease subtype. It's a project that we have ongoing right now. And so I call it HPSP-GLIA, hippocampus sparing glia. Makes a lot of sense to me. It doesn't need to make sense outside of the lab, but that hippocampus sparing glia has several different stains of interest. We focus on human studies in my group, but we support a lot of our collaborators who work um, with animals. I like to use the specimens to organize by stain. So my hippocampal sparing glia, H&E, whichever towel I'm interested in, whichever amyloid and my different uh, glial measures. So those are the nicely organized. For mouse people, on and off when I've worked, I, I've enjoyed recommending consideration of time points. Seems to make more sense for them everything can be different, but the main point is it's hierarchical. So you can think of this as almost the plebs that then gets organized into a, a larger group before getting organized into the overall governing body. Okay, so to ensure that I was presenting with some de-identified slides, I went ahead and found some control slides that we use as our positive controls. 
and a couple things that I'm going to just bring your attention to. This is the eSlides view. This enables you to be able to see the slide label so you can see how useful it is if the slide label has a bunch of helpful information. We can see our tissue. The stains are important to keep organized because that's how you're able to find them. I like to use the patient animal ID for my case numbers um, for down in Florida. And then if, if I'm working with uh, a Minnesota cohort, I actually use the other ones just if, so that it helps keep me organized. What I've shown you here is I like to use the comment where it'll be project name underscore the actual pathology and those reflect what specimens it is in. You can also, there's many other columns, but you can also keep track of what's already been analyzed. Okay, so I am going to harp on this because your future self will thank you. It is so important for you to think about how you name a slide. Whatever system you're in, think about that organization well in advance. Be consistent and take the time. Avoid bias within the names, as we talked about, which could actually reveal groups. And then we like to keep one of the options over here for if my team wants, so it's ask mem is what we'll put in there, and then I can easily look for it. Or once they've completed tracing, we'll put an ROI for region of interest. Um, and, but it's consistent for each project. We'll always use patient animal ID as our case number. We'll always put in the stain. We're very consistent with what the block ID is so that we can always find it. And the comment will always reflect. And then they, we do have the luxury of different data groups within the Aperio technology. So each lab could have their own data group, for instance, or each center, however it works for you. Okay, so we've moved out now from the eSlides view. <clears throat> Within that is where you can actually click to view some of your slides of interest. So this is the image scope view. You can actually utilize these squares to then view the images or name all at the same time. But within our image scope view, this is our actual interface with the slide. So this gives us a up close and personal, um, you have the option to sync the slides, which is what I've done with the crosshair. Um, I'm going to now zoom in on a different one just for illustration purposes. So the nice thing is if you open up multiple different slides of interest, you'll see them in the gallery. You have the option of zooming in, so you can double click to go straight into 20x, or if you want it to be able to be consistently 5x, you have that option. There are pseudo magnifications, so you can actually drag this guy around if you wanted to kind of get a better sense of, of what you're uh, visualizing. There is also a helpful option that allows you to have that 1x view as you zoom in, and this is so helpful for new individuals or considerations for your clinical path conferences, your CPCs. Um, when I was first learning the brain, one of the hardest parts was trying to figure out where we were, but having this guidance is that overall Google map, if you will, so you constantly are learning and, and validating your understanding of the different neuron sizes or, or what have you. One of the things I'll point out is the slide label is missing on purpose because this one actually had identifying information. So you do have the option to turn off the slide label, which is helpful. And by right clicking, you can then, or along the top, you'll see that there's many different analyzation tools. So we have a pen tool to trace. The negative pen tool removes artifacts or errors or what have you. The ruler tool, I like to recommend as a surrogate for cortical thickness, or if you're interested in other types of um, manners that can directly translate. The square tool can also be your friend. Dr. Nelson's group has used this um, and demonstrated consistency. So I like to trace out the whole cortex because I'm translating mine to neuroimaging. But the square tool can definitely be your friend where you just have to plop a, a few squares on there. The ellipse tool, do not use it thinking you can analyze it. I've trained people on this and then they don't listen and then they waste weeks of their lives. You cannot analyze with the ellipse tool unless something has changed recently, but I don't think so. The arrow tool is also really helpful for identifying your boundaries. So when you're first getting used to differences. And the cool thing is, is within image scope, you actually will have an annotation window and you can type in there. So when my people on my IHC team are 
learning and they're just kind of interested. They're actually really good at pattern recognition um, to find people who like puzzles and they'll go in and they'll they'll kind of guess as they're learning and it helps them very quickly then um, apply it. So without going into too much detail for burden analyses, there's two major options um, that are really quite useful, positive pixel count and color deconvolution. The positive pixel count is based upon the color wheel. So it's 360 degrees, which then translates. Um, and so you're able to adjust it accordingly uh, to pick up brown or what have you. Um, I think it's like 0.1. And then the color deconvolution uses red, green, and blue component. So the RGB, it's based upon optical density. And you actually have an optical density measure within any of your uh, Windows products if you right click to just kind of get a sense. Uh, but you can adjust that accordingly. And there's different reasons for when you would use or when I like to use them. So I like to use positive pixel count with um, better for pale staining. So on my A beta slides with the diffuse pathology can really be subtle. So I find that the positive pixel count to be um, helpful and, and you'll want to then multiply by 100 the positivity output. I like the color deconvolution when there's a broad range of staining and you can then actually adjust certain weak positive as your background. I always keep in mind lipofuscence. So I think it's at about 185 I go above. And then I'm just gonna point out a, a stain that I wouldn't actually want to use, but should you have ones with really bad background, what you can see on the left is the stain. And all of this yellow is actually the weak positive nature that I'll use as my background. So I'll only then export out the red color in this instance, which is the strong positive. So you can use the different types of levels to your advantage. And one of the other really nice things is it comes out and you can export it as a .csv file. So comma separated variable, which can then be converted to a spreadsheet, um, Excel or um, what other spreadsheet services that are used. And that's where you can just really make it easy on yourself. Multiply by 100 positivity. So we like to highlight our columns of interest to ensure whomever is first um, learning is comfortable. With the color deconvolution, it automatically comes out as a percent. So you don't have to multiply there. OK, last couple slides. Uh, some things to think about with your experimental design. Think about non-diseased controls. So you want to know what basal level would be. I think you would include those anyways. Um, the output data is continuous, which is really helpful. So you have that really that beautiful range of severity. The neuro, your neuroanatomy skills are going to greatly improve because you're going to want to set very defined boundaries so that when you're writing it up in your methods, others can replicate it. And I very much like having the same individual trace so that it is consistent within a project. Right now we have a project where we're tracing the cortex in the hippocampus. So we actually have two people on the team. One person's only doing cortex, so it's super consistent. One person's doing the hippocampus, and then we compare and we ensure that there is continuity. Um, the biggest piece of advice, if you're doing multiple layers, let's say CA1, subiculum, parahippocampal cortex, always do it in the same order. It's very important because it'll export in a very consistent way. My ability to embrace digital pathology would not be possible without having so many awesome folks come through the lab. And I'm very grateful because I consistently learned something new. Um, Dr. Maloney came and joined the team and she taught me about the tracing pads and people super like that, um, but they all approach it with super duper excitement and it's a really great educational tool. Okay, so without further ado, I think we can break for our conversations. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much. That was a nice walkthrough of the Aperio software, which I have to, as I mentioned, I'm not very experienced with. Um, however, I have used the eSlide Manager in the past for, you know, various unknown teaching sessions, and I thought that that was really great and can be really useful in, you know, pathology residency or fellowship training, so people are able to, you know, preview on the bus for unknown slide sessions. Um, so that's really great. So we do have a question here. So from Brent Harris, many slide labelings now have barcoding. Can the Aperio scanner recognize these? 
Michael, do you? Oh, do you have your phone isn't on again? Almost. The joys of uh, phone. Oh, you're back. So um, I was on. I was on mute. So, so yes, we do have the ability of doing barcodes with uh, eSlide Manager. So there's a couple of different ways that that can be done. That can be done uh, either through actual parsing of information that's in the barcode, or through an LIS interface where we can interface uh, with your laboratory information system and transfer that uh, bi-directionally to. Um, by directionally to eSlide Manager, and then from eSlide Manager, sending a link to the LIS, so a pathologist is actually working uh, in a uh, or in the work list of this LIS. So again, a little bit different ways. Uh, the format has to be specific for doing barcode parsing. Example would be um, a session number, um, block number, or specimen number, and either a stain or or slide number. So with those three fields, we can build a case within eSlide Manager. Is there any program specific that you've worked with or uh, any other, is there any certain companies? Well, we have a, a Leica has a group that's dedicated to, um, it's dedicated to nothing more than doing interfaces. Oh. So we can do interfaces with pretty much any LIS that you have. I mean, we've got a lot with Copath, uh, a lot of what we see now is uh, Epic Beaker. Um, so it just really, they, they do nothing more than do HL7 messaging for, for LIS. So we have to work with that particular company as well. But um, I can, you know, I could probably, either you can send me an email saying, you know, can you interface with this? Or do you have any uh, examples of interfaces with this LIS? But as long as they, the, the uh, third party is uh, willing to work with us, we can write an interface for them. Uh, Rush, we um, we also have the new, we have a 2D barcode on our newest slides. And um, those slides, just like how you said, Michael, they get passed out and they automatically create a case um, in our eSlide manager. And those slides basically get populated in that case. Um, but for our retrospective slides, and these are hundreds of slides, we don't have barcodes. And so one of the approaches that we have done at Rush is work really closely with our data management team. And we've been able to create a page so that there's an optical character recognition software to kind of uh, recognize the details on the labels to then auto populate a page which then staff can go in and approve. And then that auto populates eSlide manager. So that's another approach um, to reading um, slide labels with ease. Um, and I would urge um, our listeners to work closely with data management or try to find people who are in IT support and data management teams uh, to help you out there. That's right. Right. Yeah, so we have a few more questions coming in. Um, we'll just start with this one because I kind of maybe follows up a little bit better with the initial discussion. Can you query the scanner, say find all slides with Hippocampus for women aged 70 to 75? Um, maybe if you wanna go around and discuss how each, uh, at each of your institutions with what you're doing with digital pathology, what search options are available uh, within East Slide Manager or how you would go about searching um, in some of the older cases, Olivia? Um, so, when, so when we do the digital scanning and any neuropathology evaluation, we are blind to all the characteristics of that patient or participant. Um, so we don't have age documented. However, we do have random IDs um, uh, given to each participant. So we can search via that, um, but that's eight digits. And so that can be a little bit more trickier. Um, but we also have within the lab, a five digit or it's actually a four digit number with a B in front of it. Um, and so we search pre predominantly using that field as well as the stain. 
um, and we keep all other information de-identified on our slide labels. I think one, one important aspect is what Dr. Murray says. Uh, first and foremost is think about what you want to ask, right? before you start scanning is what are you going to need down the road? Um, so because you can have all those things if that's something that you need, right? You can, you can instead of slide ID or whatever, you can give it an age or location or whatever. So you can do as much as you want or as little as you want, but it depends on uh, what is the question down the road. And obviously there is a limit, right? I, I just wanted to mention something quickly about scanning and labeling. and. Um, most of the people probably that is in the panel um, and, and in the in the webinar are doing research. Therefore, their, their, their slides are already de-identified, but sometimes you may use or you may need previously clinical slides either from autopsy. So you have to be careful that those scanning don't, they don't transfer personal, you know, identifiable information. So rather either put on top a new, you know, a label that is standard for your research and make sure that that doesn't transfer because it's really difficult later on. You can do it. You can do it. You can remove that identifiable information, but it's an extra step and it takes time. If it's one slide, it's fine. If you have 200 slides, it's a pain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, that's um, one thing I wanted to say on that regard. Michael, did you have, do you want to comment on this one? Sure. So for, for searches, uh, so the Aperio database is a SQL database or standard query language, SQL. So eSlide Manager uh, has the, is, is a user interface for that database. So the search function, you're running queries on information that already exists within the data table. So you can pretty much search for anything that has or, or search for any information within those uh, fields within eSlide Manager. You can go uh, contains, includes, you can look at date values between a uh, couple of dates. So uh, again, it's just basically uh, you know, a user interface. It's, it's, it's an easy way of, of accessing your data without actually having to know SQL. Mm -hmm. Yep, <clears throat> and I think mine's probably an average of everybody's uh, response. So. And direct answer to your question, in consideration of what Dr. Posse just said, yes, we don't include demographics. I don't want my people knowing that it's a young onset Alzheimer's disease case versus a late onset. Uh, that way, it just once again removes that bias. The includes feature that he just mentioned was a game changer because then you can actually input many different identifiers to pull out those cases. And, and so if I want to know who has had CP13 on the hippocampus and I actually have a list, I can input that. You, it's limited on the certain number of characters, but it still works very well. Uh, my postdoc is now chronicling everything that we have scanned, so we'll actually have a searchable database on it. But there are many different really helpful ways to search the database. That depends on you inputting the information. Yeah, I would uh, piggyback on Dr. Murray's comment of just, you know, making sure that you take time to put in the information that you want um, and that you want to search for and just keep it consistent. Keep it consistent throughout. Um, I think that's just a really important point, which I think Dr. Murray made really clear in her presentation. That's great. Um, so next question, what methods both pre, during and post analysis are available for adjusting for staining batch differences? Question. What was that question one more time? I'm sorry. Um, so uh, what methods, both pre, during, and post analysis are available for adjusting for staining batch differences? Oh, while well, he's, there. So, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say, you know, it's always easier if you're using an automated staining system where everything is consistent each time. If you're doing if you're doing staining by by hand, of course there are variations. Um, you know, in terms of fluorescent microscopy or, or doing fluorescent scanning, 
that's always an issue. I've worked with technologies in which we have used a pooled sample of um, of um, labeling or, or labeled, let's say, different proteins that have been fluorescently labeled, using that as a cocktail to normalize against different signals like site five and site, you know, site three and site five. Um, you know, bright field, there's always that, you know, there is always that variability that, you know, that's there. And I really don't know if I can think off the top of my head any way to normalize any sort of background. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's not, I think, uh, technology wise, what you said in the beginning was exactly it. Super recommend auto stainer. The manual stain, I've just seen too much variability. Um, but one thing that you could consider, and um, it'd be a lot, is if you have the same control slide, you can measure that control slide and do adjustments. But the hope is that you are bringing in sort of continuity where you're not adjusting between each batches. And so actually staining in, in continuity is, is really the ideal option. I was gonna say also a couple a couple of things is uh, for when you do immunostains. I don't have experience with immunofluorescence, but with immunostains, with counter stain is very important. Like if you have a weak counter stain to begin with, it's a pain. So mm -hmm. just from pre-analytical point of view, like uh, you know, that's something that is worth uh, spending some time getting that right. The other thing is that you can always uh, get your uh, like um. If you have dedicated people, that is the one, and we're lucky to have that, like uh, are the ones who are always loading the slides. So they have like a protocol. They always like clean the slide the same way, you know, put the slides in the same order. And they can also do like a white balance or like an area that is, this is white and therefore everything is gonna be normalized. To that. So you could potentially normalize. And especially if you have batches, yeah, you can have the entire batch normalized to that. So that's very helpful as well. And, and the other pre-analytical thing that I think is very important, particularly for what you guys do, that is like a spatial and like, um, you know, measuring thickness or comparing things is uh, cutting the slides oriented in the same way all the time. <laughs> so that's really difficult when it's the clinical and you send it to the lab and they send you the hippocampus on the left and then on the right and then upside down, right? So we can always switch it in the scope, but once you scan, you can also do it. Um, but if it's just tilted or it's just one more step. So that standardization for like anything that is quantitative is very important because it will save time down the road. All right, so now we have a two part question. Uh, during the scan setup, is the compression rate assigned by default or can you assign a specific compression rate? If the latter is true, what is an optimal compression rate? So we can set basically within the AT2 different compression types, um, you know, lossless, um, you know, lossy, like JPEG, uh, TIFFs, um, uncompressed so uh, slides, uh, I don't have a, you know, I don't have a scanner in front of me to kind of tell you what, um, what the compression, you know, we don't, we don't set a, a percentage of compression saying such as, um, you know, I want, you know, 50% compression or 30% compression of my images, uh, but you can, uh, you can select for different types of compression within the AT2 and that probably in the and the, our default setting is our recommended it's the high the, the most highly compressed um, the most highly compressed availability on that particular system so I think it probably you know compresses it around 20 to 1 something like that And that is, and that saves it in the SVS format, which is uh, basically a, a TIFF file with JPEG 2000 compression. So I just have a comment from Pete Nelson related to the previous question. He just says that he's actually not such a big fan of automated stainers and here 
we do it by hand. I think that technical factors are more variable in auto scanners, <laughs> variability in the antibody fixation and whatnot than people think. A specific example is TDP43, where I've seen some sketchy results from auto stainers. Yep, I, I can see both sides and have also had many challenges with uh, validation in the clinical lab for TDP antibodies. So yeah, perhaps maybe even antibody specific at times. Yeah, and I, I think getting to know your auto stainer, I think it's a good point, Pete. Is if you have it working in your group and your uh, people are better than the machine, I always like when people are better than the machines. What we've found with some of our auto stainers is the, they'll prescribe 48 slides, but we'll actually do 36, so we avoid the edges. And we always ensure that there's a control slide. And then I teach my people about dehydration because, yeah, they'll sometimes be cases where just the rimming of the tissue. So that it's not that auto stainers are perfect. They definitely come with their own issues. But if you're a novice, I guess, thinking about both, yeah, it's still a good idea. And then we have a uh, next question. Can you elaborate on tissue exhaustion? What leads to exhaustion and what can be done to reduce slash remedy exhaustion? So I'm assuming I'm understanding the question. Yeah. For I I could start not really specific to Aperio, but I mean, for, for Northwestern and our brain bank, and I'm sure for most, there are just particular uh, sample types. So both sample group as well as region that seem to be in much higher demand than other regions or cases and tends to be, you know, controls, hippocampus, entorhinal cortex, and um, you only have a limited amount of tissue from that area in any given individual's brain. So some of the things that can be done to reduce or remedy it, in my experience, has been to always save every section cut. So I'm a big uh, fan of this and promote that others potentially even consider doing this is um, if you're, you know, cutting samples of very valuable hippocampus for for example, you can cut serial sections and then label them in your storage. So you have every sequential level and it's all organized. And um, in addition to having them on hand, you minimize the uh, number of times an individual has to go in to reface the block to cut additional sections. So those are my tips. I don't know if anybody else has additional comments or suggestions to consider. It's just. What we've started to do is at the time of brain cutting, cut an extra hippocampal block from a case that we'll use for optimization. Don't optimize on a precious case. Consider anterior cingulate, which is a very interesting brain region, but not highly sought after. So if you're gonna cut 30 slides, cut from there instead. And then the beauty of digital pathology, I think one of the best ways to conserve tissue is cloning your slide, right? Like you can, this is the whole, if you get all of those pre-analytical steps set up, you can still utilize that slide then, again, for a different experiment, but it's the same stain, same dilution. Definitely, and then with digital pathology, you know, if multiple people want to request tissue uh, and do the same, you know, tau stain, for example, you can just easily share that without having to use another slide, so. Uh, all right, so we have a next question. Could color deconvolution be used to determine the color composition of a stain of interest in order to build slash modify new macros? For example, microvessel analysis. What would the optimal workflow be for this type of usage? So we have a specific, we have a specific algorithm for microvessel detection. So you know, colored convolution is, is mostly a single channel uh, color detection, right? So it's an area analysis. Um, it's not an object-based analysis, although I think I've used it to kind of, you know, in, in, in specific workflows to kind of do it, but it's not optimal for doing object-based. So what I would recommend for microvessel detection is using a microvessel um, a microvessel algorithm for that. Uh, it's not the easiest to use because, you know, you have to, there, there are a lot of different parameters to tweak within that 
that particular algorithm in regards to you know completion parameters um, you know background and everything else uh, but you know it is an object detecting algorithm so I don't know if that's necessarily really answering your question using color deconvolution. I mean, all of our algorithms for the most part use RGB color deconvolution, um, at least the, the bright field algorithms with, with a few exceptions, um, you know, the uh, RGB values and kind of determining what is brown within image, uh, again, in this case, to find microvessels. Yeah, just to add on to Michael's point, there's a really a uh, beautiful um, study by um, Dr. Nelson, Pete Nelson's group, um, and they also used the microvessel algorithm. They did a variety of stains for the vasculature and worked through the different parameters that the um, microvessel macro has. So I would urge you to check that paper out. I just had a question about how Aperio software works. So for example, is it a package that you get or is it individual modules, a combination of the two? Um, how does AI fit in just compared to some of the other software options out there? Sure. So basically we have we can sell by different by different algorithms. We can sell in specific packages. Say for instance our wholesale quantification package is uh, nuclear membrane and cytoplasmic detection. Uh, we have a package for FL, which is, you know, um, our, our fish algorithms, um, our, our immunofluorescent, um, cellular immunofluorescent algorithm, uh, and our area, uh, FL area quantification, which is co-localization for area analysis. Uh, I believe we also still offer the toolbox. Uh, we, we make changes, so I, I can't, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of on the semi sales side, but not, you know, not exactly sure of what, how we offer a lot of this stuff. Um, so the, the toolbox includes all of our different algorithms, uh, with the exception of Genie, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, so in terms of the way that we sell this, we can sell it for, you know, in terms of a hub license, which basically is installed on the Imperio, you know, the Imperio server, um, where uh, it's basically a network solution where anybody on your network, as long as your eSlide manager administrator gives you permission to use it, you can use it that way or on a workstation uh, a, a license, which basically then you're, you're, you're you're inhibited in regards to working only on uh, a workstation as opposed to any computer on your network. So you have to take your image uh, from wherever it's scanned to and to get to that computer. Um, in regards to AI, um, we do have Genie, which is not artificial intelligence, it is more machine learning. You know, you as a user are giving, it, uh, giving the, the algorithm examples of um, what you're wanting it to train for. In terms of Leica, um, Leica uh, AI, you know, I can't really comment on that right now. I sent into, you know, an internal working group on AI. Um, other companies do have uh, AI solutions that uh, Aperio images can be used in. Uh, we've worked with several different ones. Page is the one out of Memorial Sloan Kettering although I really don't know that much about it. Um, but again, right now we don't have a AI offering through, through uh, Leica, it is more machine learning. And uh, for your machine learning and I guess Genie it's called, are you able to, once you train it for a particular uh, lesion of interest, are you able to then take that setting and apply it to other studies or is do you have to recreate it every time? Well, it, more than likely you have, depending upon what you're doing, uh, you know, apply it for each time. So I worked with Melissa, it was late last year, early this year on 
on some of the slides that she's shown. Uh, she, she had much better results than I did on my initial one. So, you know, those were, were really nice looking. Um, but, you know, you would have different studies. If, if the study was the same thing, you know, it, it's like it's like anything else in terms of image analysis. You know, you're you have the ability of saving your settings, whether or not it's an algorithm or if it's through a, through a genie classifier. But, you know, if you're, you know, if, if there are differences within that study uh, of what you're trying to to do, then, yes, you would have to, you know, develop a new, you know, uh, um, a new classifier uh, for that particular study. And it, specifically, Maggie, <clears throat> we're working on the locus aurelius right now, and you have to edit the vessels because I have a really good nuclear macro that works beautifully, but my people have to go back in and re-edit out all of the vessels. And so Michael was amazing, worked with Christina Maloney and I in my group, and she was like, I don't want to edit all these vessels. So she created a layer to be able to recognize the, the vessels. And then what's neat about Genie is you essentially are telling it what to look for. And then you get to superimpose like a burden analysis or a cellular count using one of the nuclear macros. And Pete Nelson likes to say that a period exists for Genie <laughs> or something like that. It's very music. Like for him, Genie is the end all be all and he has worked and utilized it beautifully in his group. Actually, I think it was Dr. Neltner and his group or his colleague that designed a lot of it, but yeah. Yes. I would just say that regardless of the technology, just having the ability to have a digital slide, you can use that digital slide for many different purposes down the road for AI and ML. So. Very cool. These were really good questions. Covered mm -hmm. the gamut. Yeah. Dr. Capasi, I will be following up with you about this barcoding. I'm very interested to hear how you guys have applied that because it's coming up the road. Yeah, we're scanning in a lot of our retrospective cases that don't have barcodes and it has made our staff's lives much easier instead of having to type in each individual label. It's great that we can get these kind of systems and tools to help us. It's great. And it's more interesting and exciting things. <laughs> Absolutely. So Pete says, check credit to Dr. Neltner. Yeah. Yeah. She mm -hmm. created all of these fantastic genie workflows. What do we call them, Michael? Genie. Um, classifiers or? Yeah, classifiers. Thank you. Or, or genie projects. Yeah. Yeah. They've gone running with it for several years now. Yeah, we also work with Jeannie um, here at Rush too, and it's a really nice tool, um, very simplistic to use. And as long as you give uh, the system a good range of morphologies for it to like learn, you know, what to classify, it's, it's a really nice tool. Nice. I think we're just about out of time. So I just wanted to take a minute to Thank all of you panelists today for your participation and insight. Uh, it's much appreciated. I feel like I learned a lot. And uh, just briefly wanted to point out that November, we will not have a webinar session. We will have uh, one of our group meetings from the Digital Pathology Working Group and resume December 13th, uh, where we will be kicking off our QPath software overview session. So hope to see everyone December 13th, uh, 11 a.m. Eastern time for QPath Software Overview and Applications in Neuropathology Research. Um, thank you everyone for joining and see you next time. Thank you.